Well, thank you to everyone for, uh, for attending today. I think this is going to be a, a fun topic and there clearly was uh, uh, a lot of interest in this topic. There were, we are at capacity for the event, so that's pretty, uh, pretty great. So hopefully no one gets bumped out. Um, my name is Jonathan Bidlack. I'm the director of the Fiscal and Budget Policy Project at the R Street Institute, uh, which basically, uh, uh, well, our, our tagline is to, is to promote free markets. And so I think, um, you know, the, the Pentagon is a very interesting area, and it's often an area that's forgotten by many on the right, and uh, not everyone. Uh, and so I think this will be a very interesting topic to kind of talk about uh, a little bit about how both sides of the, of the political spectrum um, view this issue and and ways to perhaps get reform. My my personal view is that there's a lot of uh, agreement on both sides and I think we're likely to see that among our panelists today. Um, I'm going to let everyone here uh, introduce themselves and, and their organizations but I just wanted to uh, give a quick uh, quick rundown of who is on our panel. Um, uh, Andrew Lotz is a policy and government affairs manager at the National Taxpayers Union. Uh, he recently co-authored an op-ed uh, uh, with, with me as well in, uh, in Politico talking about the case for uh, reducing Pentagon spending. Amandi Smithberger is director of the Strauss Military Reform, Reform Project, the Project and Government Oversight at POGO, and uh, very much an expert on these issues. And uh, Wendy Jordan is a senior policy analyst at Taxpayers for Common Sense and uh, has perhaps a little bit of a, uh, an inside baseball uh, perspective as well as the, uh, uh, the outside perspective. So um, very much looking forward to hearing from Wendy as well. Um, you know, for me, I'll just, uh, you know, preface my uh, uh, remarks a little bit and say that um, I think, you know, Pentagon spending really comes down to trade-offs like anywhere else. Um, I come at things from a budgetary perspective, and I guess you could say a fiscally conservative perspective. And, uh, you know, when fiscal conservatives tend to look at areas of the federal budget, uh, they sort of see trade-offs and, and look at it from the perspective of, you know, what are we paying and what are we getting in return? And I think sometimes that, uh, that same framework is not applied to the Pentagon in quite as rigorous of a way. And uh, I think you know, we are obviously in a time right now where uh, trillions of dollars have been spent in response to the novel coronavirus. Uh, and that's you know, aid to, to individuals, to businesses, to state and local governments. And so uh, the trade-offs the federal government is likely to face uh, you know, at the current time, but also you know, in the coming months and years, I think is gonna be a lot starker than it was in the past. And so uh, you know, there's this notion that's out there right now that I think is a legitimate one that everything needs to be on the table. And you know, part of my goal is to, is to again, sort of you know, get that framework that fiscal conservatives use with respect to many government agencies and departments um, and shine that light on, on the Pentagon as well. And I think we all, we all sort of acknowledge that, um, you know, there's, there's the proverbial waste, fraud, and abuse, but there are also a lot of things that, you know, we're doing perhaps in the foreign policy space that we may want to rethink as well. And, um, you know, there's no better time than right now to sort of reassess uh, uh, where we are, um, you know, ultimately spending our money on. And so uh, we'll obviously talk more about these issues, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to Andrew next to, to say a few words about uh, his work at, at National Taxpayers Union. Sure. Uh, thanks so much, Jonathan. Uh, again, I'm Andrew Lotz. I'm Policy and Government Affairs Manager at National Taxpayers Union, or NTU. Um, NTU's mission is to be an advocate and a voice for America's taxpayers. Uh, and, and it's long been clear to us that in many respects, the Pentagon budget is failing taxpayers. Um, we're spending almost double what we did 20 years ago on an annual basis, and we're not seeing results that are doubly as good for taxpayers when it comes to providing for the common defense, which is the constitutional impetus for the Pentagon. Uh, if one acknowledges that $750 billion per year on defense spending is inefficient and wasteful, uh, it begs the question, what's the solution? Uh, less spending over time and more accountable and transparent Pentagon budget, uh, that's NTU's answer, uh, but we've always tried to be exceedingly realistic that we won't achieve those results overnight. Um, so we work to achieve incremental reform instead, and we think our efforts have been successful in part because of the wide variety of allies that we've worked with this year. Uh, we've worked with Senator Bernie Sanders, who's a Democratic Socialist, and Representative Ralph Norman, who's a pro-Trump conservative. We've worked with Senator Chuck Grassley, uh, an Iowa Republican who has served for decades, and Representative Katie Porter, a California Democrat who just uh, came into office in 2019. 
Uh, and of course, we couldn't do all of this without the help of fierce advocates like you, Jonathan, and Mandy and Wendy. Uh, I've been doing this for less time than each of you, but I've learned a lot from all of you, mostly uh, that there's a cross ideological constituency for making the Pentagon budget work better for taxpayers. And despite all the doom and gloom that we may address in the next hour, uh, it does give me some optimism for the future. So thanks so much. And uh, I'm looking forward to the, to the conversation. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Mandy, why don't you uh, go next? Sure. And thanks so much for having me. So for me and for POGO, it really comes down to accountability. The Project on Government Oversight was initially founded as the Project on Military Procurement. And we were a front group for Pentagon whistleblowers who were concerned about wasteful and unsafe weapon systems being delivered. So a lot of our approach is using the tools of investigative journalism to uncover waste, fraud, and abuse, and then advocating for solutions. When you're looking at the Pentagon budget, you're seeing a lot of that waste and fraud and lots of opportunities for solutions. I think there needs to be real conversations about setting priorities and that when you have kind of endless spending, you don't set those kinds of priorities and it leads to more waste and just ineffectiveness that there are overdue debates about what we're doing as, as you mentioned with foreign policy and endless wars. And I one of the things that first really got me engaged on these issues as, was as an intern at POGO where our national security investigator, Todd Bowers, was a Marine, uh, came back, was really outraged by the kind of corruption he was seeing. And one of the like misplaced priorities we have in Washington was that, in this case, Congress was taking money for night goggles and giving it to V-22s that the department hadn't asked for. That, you know, It was a controversial weapon system to begin with. And Todd's family had to buy his own night goggles, which ended up being what saved his life. And I think that's when we're talking about a budget and priorities that really aren't keeping our military safe, aren't protecting our defense. And that's what really inspired me that it's really important that we stay engaged on these issues to make sure that our government is doing what's best for all of our safety and national security. Thanks again, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thanks, Mandy. Go ahead, Wendy. Well, again, thank you for having us all, Jonathan. I appreciate being part of this. Uh, Taxpayers for Common Sense, Sense, or TCS as we're called, is a nonprofit, nonpartisan budget watchdog group. Uh, we don't just work on Pentagon, is Pentagon issues. We have a large energy and natural resources section, ag, uh, um, disaster relief. Uh, our view is if it doesn't work, we shouldn't be funding it. Um, so, and we also believe that, that the entire federal government, and that includes the Pentagon, obviously, needs to live within its means, uh, and we shouldn't be jacking up the deficit. Uh, you alluded to me having inside baseball knowledge, and uh, so I will say that I've been handling uh, Pentagon budget issues for more than 35 years, uh, which means I, I started when I was five, so if anyone's doing the math. Uh, and I worked, uh, I, I have a broad range of perspectives on the issues. Uh, I worked on the Hill. I worked for both a Democrat and a Republican on the Hill, which makes me a, a unicorn. Uh, and I worked in the Pentagon. And I was uh, the, uh, I lobbied as a senior executive for a publicly traded government contractor. So I have pretty much seen it from all sides. Uh, I um, look forward to taking part in the conversation and I'm ready when you are. Awesome, thank you, Wendy. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention at the beginning, but for anyone who has questions, um, feel free to use the question and answer uh, uh, part of Zoom rather than the chat window, just so uh, we'll be able to go and, and hopefully answer some as we go along. Uh, you know, we'll, hopefully if we have time at the end, we'll, uh, we can answer more there, but uh, my hope is that uh, if you ask them as we go along, we'll be able to, to address them as, we, as we're going through particular topics. Um, well, thank you all for that. And I think, uh, I think what I'd like to do now is maybe start off with a little bit of, of controversy uh, at the beginning and talk about where the two parties and sort of the two um, ends of the political spectrum are on these issues. Um, you know, so I obviously come at things, as I said, from a little bit more of a fiscally conservative perspective. And my, uh, you know, I think, I think oftentimes uh, we levy the critique that the right is inconsistent. And so, uh, you know, feel free, anyone who'd like to answer this question, but I'm curious as to how inconsistent you think the right is. I mean, one of the arguments that I hear all the time uh, 
is that the Pentagon doesn't really matter as a share of the federal budget nearly as much as it did in the past. You know, the, we're now, you know, under 20% of the federal budget uh, is, is, you know, consumed by the Pentagon. And the argument is that uh, entitlement spending is basically squeezing other parts of the, of the, the budget, uh, not just the Pentagon, but discretionary spending in general. And so given that, if we're concerned from a budgetary standpoint, um, how important is it really to focus on the Pentagon? Shouldn't we be looking at some of these other other areas? And so uh, I'm curious to hear uh, hear any perspectives that uh, that you all might have on that. I'll 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 take a crack at it. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, uh, you know, we actually heard this uh, you and I, Jonathan, in some of the critiques of our op-ed. Um, in Politico on, on reducing the Pentagon budget, um, this sort of line of thinking that, you know, well, uh, the real issue is with mandatory spending. And I think from NTU's perspective, and, and I don't want to speak for you, but I, I'd also venture to guess from our street's perspective, mandatory, mandatory spending is critical. Uh, NTU has supported various entitlement reform efforts for years, and we're going to continue to do so. But it, it's just one part of the picture. Um, you know, Take CBO's budget outlook for the next 10 years, which they most recently published in March. Uh, they projected that we're going to spend about $60 trillion over the next 10 years. That's mandatory spending, discretionary spending, and net interest on the debt. Uh, about $38 trillion of that, uh, so a little less than two-thirds, is on mandatory programs, most of that on Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. Another $16 trillion is on discretionary spending, and that's, that's a significant amount as well. Uh, it, it's discretionary spending in total is more than we're projected to spend on Social Security security in the next 10 years. And half of that discretionary spending, $8 trillion, uh, will be on defense. That's about 13% of spending in the next 10 years. Um, if you were to take a hypothetical household budget, let's say $1,000 per month, and that's a you know unrealistic household budget, but just for the sake of, of easy math. Um, if I were looking to make cuts in that budget, if that was my budget and I was looking to make cuts in my household budget, I, I would definitely take a look at a line item that cost me $130 per month. That's what the defense budget is to taxpayers. Uh, so I think it's on us, uh, particularly fiscal conservatives like you and I, Jonathan, to make clear to Republicans that there's no comprehensive budget and spending reform effort that excludes defense spending. Uh, there's been insistence on parity in the past. Republicans and many Democrats defend the Pentagon budget. Democrats defend non-Pentagon parts of the budget. That's sort of the stereotypical way it goes. But all that parity has gotten us over the last 10 years, particularly in the Budget Control Act window, is unsustainable practices in all parts of the budget. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's mandatory spending is part of the picture, but, but that cannot be an excuse for Republicans and conservatives to ignore the defense budget. And unfortunately, I, I feel like that's what it's been for many stakeholders in the last decade. Yeah, let me ask, a, oh, sorry, go ahead, Wendy. Uh, I would also point out that in discretionary spending, if you're just looking at discretionary spending, uh, the Pentagon is by far the largest share of discretionary spending. Uh, so if you, um, uh, just the base budget of the Pentagon, which is, you know, 640, let's say, uh, billion dollars, a little less than that, uh, in the 21 budget request, uh, the next closest is the Department of Veterans Affairs, and that is 105 billion. So, you know, there's a lot of runway between 640 billion and 105 billion. Next is uh, the Department of Health and Human Services. And then fourth, if it was its own agency, which it isn't, uh, would be the Overseas Contingency Operations account at 69 billion in this year's request. So, uh, you know, you have to add one and four to really get number one. Uh, and that puts the Pentagon at over 705, but just the Pentagon, not national security spending, but just Pentagon spending at about $705 billion. So uh, I think there's a lot of room in the discretionary side as well uh, to take a, a crack at that. Mandy, let me ask a question to you on this, uh, this same topic. You know, you probably heard uh, Secretary Esper's remarks this week, week about uh, rethinking some of the, um, some of the healthcare spending that uh, relates to the Pentagon. And, uh, and the president quickly said, no, that's kind of off the table. So I'm curious what your thoughts are as this relates to some of the, um, you know, some of the, the news that's broken in the last, in the last few days. 
Uh, thank you for that question. So my colleague, Dan Grazier, has actually looked at military health care spending and what happened during the Budget Control Act. And one of the things that's interesting is that actually stayed very flat. And the places where they kept on adding more money was in weapon systems. And that we've actually seen that it's hurt the ability of the Department of Defense to respond to this current pandemic, that we haven't funded that appropriately. But I think in all of these areas, it's important to have debates about whether the spending is actually being effective or not. I think when you're talking about benefits like TRICARE, you need to be looking at, you know, is it taking care of military, the military and their families? Is it helping with retention? Is it helping us to have the most effective force that we can? And I don't think anyone is served when there aren't, there isn't an openness to have a debate about these spending priorities and whether they're actually serving what they should do. And while we've had some great um, oversight champions on the right, Senators McCain, Senators Coburn, on challenging the Department of Defense and spending in all of these areas, um, we don't really seem to have those champions as much anymore. And I think it's to the detriment of the military because I think it's helpful to even have that boogeyman of like, we can't do this stupid thing or this wasteful thing because I'm never gonna be able to justify this to Congress. And if Congress doesn't step up as a co-equal branch to make sure that the spending is achieving the goals that we have, then I think we're all hurt. Let's, um, let's uh, make sure we're, we're equal opportunity here and talk a little bit about where the left comes at from some of these things, some of these issues. I mean, you know, there was recently a, a vote, uh, the Lee Pocan Amendment, which proposed to cut the Pentagon budget by 10%. Um, and you know, very few uh, Republicans are sort of interested in, I think, that in the uh, that idea in the current uh, political climate. But shockingly, few Democrats actually uh, were also seem to be interested. I mean, there were certainly um, you know many progressives who were supportive of that amendment, but there were, I believe, it was still a majority of Democrats that did not support that effort. And so, you know, I'm curious as to to what our panelists think about you know, what prevents the center left um, or, you know, the, the moderate left, whatever you want to call it, from, uh, from sort of getting on board with um, assessing the, and reassessing, uh, you know, what we're spending money on at the Pentagon. Um, do you think it's just a political consideration and a fear of sort of being, um, you know, demagogued as weak on defense? Uh, do you think that there's sort of an ideological uh, reason as to, as to why uh, there might be some hesitancy? Um, and how do you how do you think about you know the kind of the recent battles that we've had these the the, the recent um, uh, you know discussions over the most recent NDAA as to you know shedding a little bit of light on where some of the Democrats are, are really coming from? Yeah, so I do think it is largely political. Um, I always found it frustrating that uh, even in the Democratic Party of the Blue Dogs defense spending is something they've rarely been willing to take on, even though they are supposed to be the fiscal conservatives where everything is on the table. But I think it's a false perception that, you know, you can't, again, you can't question, you can't challenge any of these kinds of spending. When, again, I think the most patriotic thing that you can possibly do is hold everyone accountable. There is no mission that is more important than our, the, our national security and safety. And just giving them a blank check and not challenging how that money is spent isn't going to make us safer and it doesn't serve anyone. If money were gonna be solving all of these problems, we wouldn't have had the military housing problems that we saw. We wouldn't be having problems with retaining pilots. There are problems that really need real public and congressional attention to be solved and throwing money at the problem, again, with the budget as large as it is, if the money was gonna fix everything, it would be fixed. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's, uh, I mean, there's no doubt that uh, both parties, I think, have been very willing to say we can just put more money at, at, at these various, um, these various programs. And, you know, this is a, a, a government wide issue. It's not necessarily just restricted to the Pentagon. But I do think that the political considerations are perhaps a little bit sharper. The other thing that I've seen over time is that there's sort of that age old guns versus butter debate that goes on. Um, you know, it, um, maybe, you know, maybe sort of ideological libertarians would like to see reductions in the Pentagon budget um, for its own sake. But I think, uh, you know, to the degree that that, that sentiment exists on, on the left, in, in my experience, there tends to be a lot of um, this is a goal, but it's only really a goal so that we can spend in other places. And so, 
you know, I'm curious of, of, of you know, your all perspective on, on the degree to which progressives see Pentagon cuts um, really is just a means to spend elsewhere, or, or do you think that, um, that there is perhaps a little bit more, uh, I should be giving more credit to, uh, to those on the, our friends on the left um, in terms of how they, how they think about these issues? Uh, well, I would say that the recent past with the Budget Control Act has really, with the framework of the Budget Control Act, has really hardened uh, the idea that there has to be parity uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna raise five dollars on the Pentagon side, you you have to raise five dollars on the non-defense side. So that has sort of um, solidified the attitude uh, in on both the left and the right uh, that somehow there always has to be a trade-off between the two sides of the budget. Um, guns versus butter has been around for donkey's ears. I don't even know how long. Uh, it's lo long enough that I uh, don't think I can recall a time when people didn't use that framework. Uh, but it, one of the things that, that we have trouble with at, at TCS, or not trouble, but one of the things that, that we emphasize is that if you're going to cut money from the Pentagon from a, a wasteful or overpriced program, then that money needs to go to deficit reduction, not to spending somewhere else. So, you know, sometimes people will come to us with an amendment idea uh, and say, well, you should be for this because it'll cut spending. Um, well, you know, if we decided to convert the Pentagon to condominiums, that would save money too. But, you know, it's not something Task Force for Common Sense is going to advocate for. So simply... Uh, something that would cut spending uh, is not necessarily helpful in the larger debate. I think something else I would just add is, at least for some progressives, they have a different perspective as to how to define national security. So they look at climate change as a national security issue that we need to pay attention to. They look at um, education and health as other issues too, particularly you can see a nexus to the degree that the military is having a hard time recruiting people who are qualified and healthy enough to serve. So there is some interconnection in these issues, but I think you can, we've generally found that the guns versus butter argumentation is not persuasive to people who don't already agree about, we need to cut the budget. But yeah, I, if, oh, sorry. Go, go ahead, Andrew. Yeah. I, I, I was going to say uh, one area, uh, Mandy, where I'm, I'm optimistic there that, that potentially we could see a change in, in the coming months uh, and years is, is because of everything that's happened uh, with, with the pandemic and, and you know, uh, with everything terrible going on. I think we, um, those of us who are, are advocates for, for better budgeting uh, need to try and take the silver linings out of this. A uh, long-term misconception that all of us uh, uh, on this uh, chat have had to have had to deal with before is that defense spending cuts or reductions make us less safe. The defense budget in fiscal year 2002, right after 9/11, was 345 billion. That includes emergency spending. Uh, this fiscal year will be north of 700 billion, inclusive of the overseas contingency operations account. Uh, that's a gigantic increase, even in real terms. Um, are we safer today? Uh, a pandemic has killed 170,000 of our own citizens. Our adversaries are finding new and unique ways to interfere with our elections and with our democratic institutions. And the nations that we spent time and treasure in for 20 years, Iraq and Afghanistan, are, are still torn by conflict and violence. At NTU, we don't make judgments about military engagements. It's not our expertise. We, we leave that to the experts, both inside and outside of government. But this broader question, have massive investments of taxpayer dollars in the military budget made us safer? Uh, that does matter to us as a taxpayer advocate. And uh, we're hopeful that, um, you know, if... Uh, if lawmakers and policymakers are to take some lessons away from this this awful period that we're in as a country, that one of them will be that um, these massive investments have not made us safer, and it's an opportunity to to rethink and reorient our budget practices for uh, practices for for the foreseeable future. Yeah, I think I think those are great points. I uh, I'll, I'll add a couple of, of things from my perspective. One is that. You know, I think that for a long time, certainly since 9-11, um, 
as a country, we have envisioned the, the biggest potential existential threat to our country to be a national security threat. And so, you know, we have spent accordingly and whether or not we've spent wisely or not is a, is a separate question. Um, but I think that it's been driven by sort of a fear that, you know, there would be some sort of terrorist attack, for example, on US soil, that this is the, this is the thing that threatens the United States the most. One of the things that I think that's changed in the last you know, few months, and it, it's obvious, is uh, a rethinking about whether or not that is our biggest existential threat. Um, you know, there, there were certainly people, I think, you know, uh, in, inside the federal government who were thinking about pandemics, but it was not something that was talked about, uh, generally speaking, in, in the mainstream press. It was not something that you know, many of our organizations were really focused on. Um, it was not something that, that most people in government were really thinking about. And so, um, I think we, we've come to realize that there are a lot of other threats. I mean, we think about things like natural disasters, for example. You talked about some of the potential environmental issues, whether you, whether you think about that in terms of climate change specifically or just generally in terms of, uh, you know, floods and, and hurricanes and so on. Um, I think, you know, it, it's sort of, from my end, it's made me think more about the need to be able to respond in a timely manner um, and also in a flexible manner. And I think that for too long, from, from my perspective, we've sort of seen um, let's, th this attitude of let's predict the potential threat beforehand, and then let's appropriate funding to that potential threat. And then we get into a situation where we don't have funding available for uh, a new threat that we didn't foresee, or we end up spending a whole lot more trying to prevent threats that um, maybe weren't, weren't as big as, as, as we thought they were. Um, the other thing, I, I think Andrew brings up a good point, and it, it, is, a, it is a messaging point uh, as well as a substantive point, uh, which is the, 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 the argument that somehow by spending less, um, you end up going and, and making the world less safe. I, you know, I, I always am reminded of, there's a, a great quote about uh, uh, entrepreneurs and there are the two, you know, we're starting a new business and it's basically, there are the two worst things that you can happen, can happen when you're starting a new business. One is uh, to not have enough money, uh, but the other is to have too much money. Um, and that's because it's very difficult to figure out how to spend that money most appropriately. And, uh, and it can create a whole host of problems. You know, for example, I mean, just on a basic level, you know, your attention may be put in areas that seem attractive because you have that funding available. Um, and, you know, I think fiscal conservatives, generally speaking, when they, when they talk about uh, federal spending, um, I think the argument is generally that imposing a budget constraint forces you to think about these trade-offs in a more tangible way. And to the degree that we don't really impose a budget constraint on the Pentagon, I think that the end result is actually, you know, maybe it's not, you know, making us per se less safer, um, but it's, it's taking away clarity from what the strategy ultimately should be. And instead we end up in a world where the dollars drive the strategy rather than the strategy driving the dollars. And, you know, I don't mean to speak for, for the other panelists, but I think, you know, from my perspective, you know, if it were determined that, you know, we laid out a strategy and it was going to take a trillion dollars to go and, and fulfill or, or meet that strategy, um, I think, you know, many of us would be much more inclined to, to be supportive in that, in that instance. We might question the strategy, but at least it would be sort of driving um, the dollars that are being asked for. I think that, you know, the presumption, and this is obviously, you know, we tie into something we can talk about a little later, um, you know, just the incentives that are faced by members of Congress and by presidents. Um, you know, the, the attitude is just, um, I don't know, throw more money at the problem uh, so that you can say that you're strong. Uh, but, but in other cases, we don't really accept that logic. And so, uh, you know, we all know the, 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 the famous quote about the national debt being our national security, uh, the largest national security threat. And, um, and whether or not you buy into that specifically, I think it, it is still a perspective worth taking seriously. And it's one that is, that is worsened to the degree that um, you know, we're not imposing a budget constraint on the, on the Pentagon. And so, um, you know, to that end, we, we got a question that uh, I think tie, you know, ties into this uh, about OCO specifically, which, uh, you know, the Overseas Contingency Operation Account, for those who aren't familiar, it's basically a, uh, an account that occurs off budget as a way of, of circumventing uh, budget caps that have existed since 2011. And uh, so I, I'm curious if, you know, the degree to which our panelists think that, that OCO specifically is something that, um, uh, you know, we should be focusing on in this light. Maybe it's maybe it's low hanging fruit as we begin to rethink our our interventions in you know places like Afghanistan, um, or is that something that maybe is a bit of a red herring given that the budget caps are are going away? And I I'd be remiss if I don't I don't throw this question to Andrew first, just because he wrote uh, 
what might be called the seminal paper of the year on the on the Oko account. So I will uh, I'll let him start there. I, I would hardly call it that, but um, but thanks, Jonathan. I, I um, yeah, we uh, I, I mean the Oko account absolutely contributes to this. Um, I, I tend to think of it as the the you know sort of most wasteful uh, slushy ten percent. 10% of the Pentagon budget. So, so in, in terms of your question, is it low hanging fruit? I do think it is, but it doesn't make it any more difficult to, to tackle. Um, you know, uh, we, as you allude to, we uh, released a paper at NTU earlier this year um, uh, that outlined 10 OCO reform options. Six of them were short term. They were meant for this NDAA or the next NDAA, just accountability and transparency measures that Congress can take to make this account, which folks across the ideological spectrum have called a slush fund, uh, more accountable to taxpayers. Um, uh, four options were more long-term looking over the next five or 10 years. And one of those options, and NTU's preferred option here, was to, to phase out the OCO account. Uh, I, I don't think people necessarily realize it, but in the years after 9-11, we did not have um, an OCO account, at least not uh, in the sense of how we know it today. We designated emergency spending uh, for uh, America's overseas contingency needs, much like we do for domestic needs, such as hurricanes or wildfires. Uh, for several years after that, we had a global war on terror designation uh, that was sort of separate from this dedicated account. Um, and what we've seen in OCO over the last few years is more and more of that account is going towards requirements that the Pentagon itself admits belong in the base budget, but they're putting it into the OCO account so that they can comply or they can seem to comply with uh, the caps set by the Budget Control Act. And a, a good chunk of, of the OCO account is also these enduring requirements, which are distinct from base requirements and how the Pentagon defends it, but are essentially requirements that will be in place or that the Pentagon expects will be in place after the overseas contingency operations in question are completed. So that's, um, it, it, it adds up to, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it, 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 for this latest version of the budget, it was somewhere between 50 and 60%, uh, maybe higher than that of the, the total OCO account, what, what the Pentagon was requesting. And, and that's, a, that's a huge issue. Uh, the fact that this account that we, that in theory is earmarked for our immediate contingency needs overseas has actually become uh, a, a, a just something that, that you can stuff um, requirements into from the base budget without having to have those requirements compete with everything else in an already gigantic base budget. Uh, it just underscores the problem. So uh, yes, it is low hanging fruit. And uh, you know, we had some victories this year on OCO reform, thanks in, in large part to all three of you uh, uh, helping us advocate on these issues with Congress, but uh, we need to do more. Uh, Jonathan, if I can jump in on the OCO issue. Uh, I um, have looked back at OCO spending over the years and the, the high watermark for uh, the request for OCO was in FY08 and it was about $187 billion. If you think about what was going on in fiscal year 08, uh, we had a major surge uh, overseas in, in the two wars uh, and overseas contingency operations, all three uh, elements of the account are met by that kind of spending. Do we at TCS think 187 billion was a lot of money? Yes, uh, but it was, um, it, it fell within the definition of what everyone uh, who is conversant on these things thinks of as OCO spending. Uh, as Andrew pointed out, there's a, a ton of, of uh, OCO for base requirements uh, broken out in the budget request uh, this year, which is in, in TCS's opinion, and I think in, in the opinion of all these panelists, indefensible, uh, no pun intended. Uh, and I always like to tell people about the, the roots of OCO, which was as a transfer fund. Uh, and it was, uh, I first ran into OCO or the designation OCO uh, when I was in, uh, at the Pentagon and the transfer fund was a little known pot of money uh, 
that was literally um, money that was swept up from accounts that had not been spent as we got close to the end of the fiscal year. So a, a call would go out from the comptroller shop, not that anybody likes to answer that call and say, yes, I have extra money. Uh, but the, the, the amounts of money that are um, reported back to the comptroller as funds that have not been obligated, uh, they were swept up into this transfer fund and it was somewhere between two and $3 billion uh, in the account. So when the army, the US army was suddenly involved in uh, unexpected overseas contingency, that's what unexpected is, operations in the Balkans, uh, they were taking it out of hide and it was uh, getting to be a drain on their budget request, what they had, what they had, had uh, appropriated for their purposes by the Congress. Uh, so they came to OSD, the Army came to OSD and said, um, it, this is happening to our budget, and the OCO transfer fund was tapped. And that's the original purpose of overseas contingency operations accounting. Uh, and I think we'll all agree we have gotten quite far away uh, when, you know, for instance, a few years ago, the Marine Corps asked uh, for... Uh, I think an F-35 to be uh, purchased to cover a, a combat loss uh, it, it, using the OCO account. So uh, if we could get back to the original definitions and uses of OCO, uh, I think it's something that more of us could support. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Um, let me ask a follow-up question, maybe play devil's advocate a little bit, uh, jumping off of a question that, that one of our attendees asked. Um, you know, if you read the national security strategy, um, the, the argument that is made, we all hear the term great power competition all the time and how this is sort of the, the, the phrase of the day. And, and, you know, this commenter asks, uh, you know, how much does, do previous defense budgets really serve as a relevant benchmark? Uh, and this is, of course, not, you know, for OCO, but also for um, for the base budget as well, um, you know, presumably you want the budget to be uh, proportional to the threats they're faced. Uh, it's very plausible that the current environment that we're in uh, requires, uh, you know, spending more to be able to address those threats than was the case in the past. Um, and so the questioner asks, how do you square the need to cut today with a broad-based consensus about more sophisticated national security challenges? i.e. the clear maturation of capabilities and, uh, and aggressiveness by Russia and China, does cutting the budget require fighting the consensus on the threats the country faces? So I'm curious to hear what the, anyone might have to add to that. I mean, I think it's important to keep in mind that the competition isn't, while there's certainly a significant military dimension, it's not only a military competition, that there are multiple aspects to this. And that continuing to invest in legacy systems is not going to be making us more agile and responsive. And I continue to be concerned that as we keep on spending on weapon systems where we're resisting efforts to do adequate cyber testing to make sure that they're hardened against the kinds of threats we know we're much more likely to face in the near and medium term, that we are not protecting our investments. And I worry about where additional funds go to and that they don't actually enhance our ability to compete and stay safe. I think that's a, I think it's a good point. Um, I think related to this one other facet that maybe we can introduce a little bit here is we've been talking very much about the specific policies um, where there might be some opportunities. Um, but there's also this sort of broader messaging question. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things that, um, uh, you know, our people who share our, our perspective on the Pentagon budget struggle with is how to really talk about these things to the, the various audiences that near, need to hear this message. So, um, you know, the general public, yes, but also the audience on the Hill. And, um, and you think about, you know, many people come at this, as we talked about earlier, uh, you know, from, from various ideologies. And so, um, I'm, I'm curious to hear uh, what you all think in terms of, is there a message on these issues that works for everyone? 
um, you know, do we need to tailor this uh, perhaps better than we do? I mean, you know, Politico ran the dueling, uh, the dueling op-eds and, you know, Andrew and I wrote one to, to speak to conservatives and, uh, and Senator Sanders wrote to sp speak to liberals. There were, there were some commonalities, but, you know, it struck me as to just how strikingly different uh, the, the, the frameworks that we were thinking about these issues were. And so, you know, maybe that makes it a little bit challenging. And, um, and you know, maybe it, it's worth sharing too, just some of the, um, you know, we've all been in meetings where we're, we're you know, trying to, uh, to get uh, members and their staffs to rethink the, the top line number at the Pentagon. And so I'm, I'm curious what strategies you might have too, uh, you know, with respect to, you know, how do you, how do you convert people? How do you get people to, to realize or to think about, um, you know, the fact that, that dollars doesn't necessarily equal, equal more safety? Uh, this is where I like to bring it to uh, examples that people can actually understand because I don't think anyone really knows what an F-35 should cost, <laughs> um, but they understand when we're spending way too much for a spare part. It doesn't seem quite right that we would be spending $10,000 on a toilet seat cover. And so some of these are bad business practices that you can see, you know, when we make decisions about whether or not we should contract something out. Do we do a cost analysis to see what might be most effective or not? Frequently, it really seems like that is not the case. And so bringing it to some of those kind of examples, including the, uh, the fact that the department you know, can't even pass an audit, I think people understand that issue because it gets to a fundamental issue of fairness and accountability. Wait, these same rules that we expect of every other federal agency to show that they are doing what they should with taxpayer dollars, they don't have to pass it and we give them more money when they fail. Like, <laughs> I think just trying, I always tell people, hold on to your common sense. Like maybe you haven't spent your whole career in national security, but you understand, you know, basically how to be accountable and responsible and look at how that spending is occurring and see if you really think that that's meeting the metrics that it should. Uh, I would also say that, you know, we, we've talked about uh, in this conversation, the old phrase, waste, fraud, and abuse. And uh, people tend to default to using that phrase. Well, of course, the Pentagon has a lot of waste, fraud, and abuse. Well, fraud has an actual definition. Fraud is a statutory uh, definition that you can, you can measure against. Waste and abuse are really in the eyes of the beholder. So, uh, it is, you know, one person, one congressional district's waste in particular uh, is not the, con the waste of another congressional district. So what uh, we, I tend to do when I'm talking to congressional staff uh, about the top line is, you know, I point out that it's massive at 705 billion uh, for the Pentagon. And then I point out the, the, what we consider at TCS the fallacy of anything that could possibly be considered an unfunded priority. Uh, if, if you couldn't shoehorn it into $705 billion, uh, maybe it's not a priority or it ought not be a priority. Uh, and so the idea that the, each of the services and now each of the agency, you know, the, the subsets of the Pentagon uh, have these unfunded priorities lists um, that that the congress the congressional committees in particular go to when they're looking to add things into the budget? Uh, I we we find these indefensible ideas at this point uh, in the you know uh, high water mark of defense spending. Well, and, and, and there are, I, I, I find, I, I agree with everything that, that uh, you, uh, uh, that, that Mandy and Wendy said, but, but um, you know, I, I find when I'm talking to, to folks on the Hill that, that you know, um, there is some messaging, there are some questions um, that, that really I think any policymaker, I, I would hope, conservative, liberal, in, in between would have the same answer to it is, do you want a more efficient and effective Pentagon? Do you like waste and, efficient and, and inefficiency in overseas contracting or in major weapons programs? Uh, do you think that massive investments taxpayers make in the military should come with a measure of transparency and accountability for the leaders tasked 
with spending that money. Again, I, I would hope that folks across the ideological spectrum would have the same answers to those questions. It doesn't make reform any easier, um, but it does at least establish where you can get someone like a Senator Sanders and an NTU, uh, uh, or you know, in terms of you know amendments that were uh, supported uh, uh, in this NDAA, where you get a Senator Sanders and a Senator Grassley to agree with each other. Um, it, I, I think we also know to, to take the inverse of this question, we, we do know messages that don't work as well. Um, and if I can sort of tie in um, uh, some of our recent work, Jonathan, I, I think uh, I, I would go so far as to say that, that defund the Pentagon is a provocative message, but it probably won't work with Republicans. Uh, we can certainly have a technical argument about what it means to defund. Some will argue it it doesn't mean zero out the budget or gut the budget, but perception matters. And, and to a lot of voters and policymakers, defund suggests something really, really drastic. Uh, and it's always been NTU's belief that the broader goals of this community, uh, reduce the Pentagon budget, make it more accountable to taxpayers, requires incremental reform. And, and this is where, with all due respect to Senator Sanders, uh, Jonathan, you and I laid out our disagreements with his approach, notwithstanding the broader shared goals. Uh, so I, I think it's incumbent on folks recommending Pentagon cuts to point to specific areas of reform. Uh, NTU Foundation has done this with US PERG, uh, which are two groups that are di on different parts of the ideological spectrum, recently released a common ground report that identifies $422 billion in specific uh, deficit reductions ideas when it, when it comes to the Pentagon budget. Um, you know, we have to do more than pull a, a Ron Swanson from Parks and Rec and chant slash it, slash it. You know, you have to offer up uh, specific ideas. That's true, although I do, I do love that scene and I do love Parks and Rec. Um, I think you all, you all touched on, on lawmakers and, and what they respond to. Um, one thing that I don't think any of you touched on uh, was this question of incentives and the incentives that they that they face. Uh, you know, we got a question that basically said, you know, is it even possible to hold lawmakers accountable? Are they responsive to um, to citizen pressure on this issue? And and I think I'll I'll go even broader and say, you know, um, what do you think holds back the perspective of um, you know what I would say are, are you know Pentagon fiscal conservatives I mean you know there are people I think there are so many groups that that, that get blamed you know we blame uh, you know people talk about members of the military who want more funding we talk about Pentagon officials who want more funding we talk about members of Congress we talk about presidents um, and so I'm curious to hear what you all think um, you know, really holds back us being able to move forward and, and what exact dynamic, if we can, can maybe try to pin it down, um, is the cause of, of, you know, constantly increasing budgets. Um, you know, my perspective, I, I will say, is, uh, you know, I, by and large, tend to put uh, much more of the blame on, on Congress and on, um, uh, you know, past presidents and current presidents. Um, um, because, you know, historically, the way I see it is, you know, uh, very often the phenomenon that we see is the Pentagon requests a certain amount of funding for their programs, both legacy and new. Um, and Congress, because of the incentives that, the, that individual members tend to face in their districts, uh, ends up going and increasing that funding even more. And we see presidents who want more funding as a result. Um, even if it's not necessarily um, something that individual voters would really care about. I mean, I think there are obviously districts around the country that, um, that you know, care about specific programs, and there are certain districts that maybe care more than others. But I think, um, you know, from my perspective, a lot of members care more about their sort of um, the broader perspective of how they're seen with respect to national defense issues than, than um, you know, with respect to any individual programs. And so, uh, unfortunately, they don't necessarily realize, I, I think, sometimes how much leeway they may have in terms of advocating for, um, you know, eliminating or defunding or just reforming uh, certain programs that exist. And so, um, you know, I'd like to hear a little bit from you all about, um, you know, how each of these actors plays a role in, in maybe hampering reform and, uh, and, you know, who's, who's to blame? You know, can we hold lawmakers accountable? I think we can. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't, and I know this is not necessarily what everyone on this panel believes, but I'd be remiss to not mention that I think there's fundamental corruption in the system. That when Eisenhower talked about the military industrial complex, he was originally going to also mention Congress as an aspect of that. So seeing Pentagon spending as a jobs program, individual members of Congress, Pentagon officials, congressional staff, 
who go through the revolving door to go work for the defense industry and see it not being career enhancing to challenge this kind of spending. I think there are real opportunities, um, but usually for like a specific program cut to happen, you need significant leadership. You know, the most prominent one I always think of is cutting the F-22 where you had the commitment from the president, you had commitment from the secretary of defense, you had the air force, you had the chair and ranking member of the Senate Armed Services Committee all working together. And, you know, talking to congressional offices about that, some of them were like, yes, we know we have jobs, but there are like seven in our district. And we can understand that we probably still need to, you know, follow that leadership. And with people with that kind of credibility say this is not a priority. I, I think combined with, you know, American citizens that a lot can be done, but you need to have a lot of stars align because there are significant pressures the other direction. Uh, I agree with a lot of what Mandy had to say there. Uh, there is significant pressure also on contractors uh, as publicly traded companies. Their responsibility, one of their responsibilities is to their shareholders and to increasing shareholder value. Uh, so that is a, a significant pressure on that portion of the, of the spectrum of people who are involved in this. And that's also a very well-funded portion of the uh, spectrum and uh, a very effective lobbying group. Uh, so, but I, I do think that there are, are programs and I'm going to once again point out the F-35 uh, program that, that uh, for instance, this year's request was for 79 airframes across the three services that fly tactical air, aircraft. So 79 airframes, that's a lot. Uh, but the House Appropriations Committee added 12 more airframes uh, in their markup to make it 91 uh, in uh, total uh, F-35s if, if the House Appropriations Committee position wins the day at the end of the FY21 budget process. So uh, the request of 79 airframes, uh, if you add up procurement and advanced procurement, which a lot of people don't add, but we do at Taxpayers for Common Sense, it was a $9.8 billion uh, request for F-35 to increase that by whatever it is, a uh, uh, 12th, uh, is a significant more, significantly more money. And a lot of members, even if they have some production of something in their district, uh, can, I think, be convinced that you know, 79 is a lot too, and maybe we don't need these extra 12 and another 91. I would also point out that, you know, if you are burning through your production rate uh, early on at the beginning of the operational um, uh, era of the aircraft, when you get toward the end, uh, then you're going to get to that end faster. And that means that the people in the plants around the country will be unemployed earlier. Now it's going to be a couple of decades in the future, but that is also a consideration that I think uh, it's an argument that can be made against accelerating procurement of an of a you know the the largest and most expensive procurement program of, uh, in Pentagon history. Well, and. and um... Uh, I agree with everything that, that's been said. And, and Jonathan, to your question, um, I, I'll share an anecdote uh, from, from some recent research because I think it illustrates how, you know, even though all of the above can be a, a cop-out answer to your question, you know, who's responsible for, for you know, the continuing unsustainability of, of, of our defense budgets, I, I think that is the answer. When I was researching for, for the OCO paper, I came across an anecdote that in fiscal year 2016, the Department of Defense pledged to create a plan for transitioning all of its enduring costs in the OCO account back to the base budget. They had planned to do so over four fiscal years from 2017 to, through 2020. 
uh, that plan uh, never got publicized and never materialized. And the reason why is because DOD said the plan was effectively rendered moot by Congress, including overly generous OCO targets uh, in its Bipartisan Budget Act of 2015. Uh, I feel like we snatched defeat from the jaws of victory there. Um, and, and, you know, luckily we're, you know, that an amendment to that effect was included uh, uh, in this year's, uh, in the House version of this year's NDA, and we're going to be fighting for that to, to remain uh, as, as lawmakers go to conference. But I think, you know, it illustrates that real spending reform is, I think, going to require at least three things here in D.C. The first is a Congress that's willing to re-examine legacy weapons programs and overseas spending and these other, you know, sort of prime areas of waste that we've discussed uh, over the last hour. Second is a president and a Pentagon that act as partners on reform rather than resisting it. And third is responsible political actors, uh, whether those are folks on the Hill or in the administration or people outside of government who resist the urge to frame every penny uh, of cuts from the Pentagon budget as a loss to safety and security, which goes back to another issue that we were talking about earlier. So I think all three of those things have to happen at the same time and they have to be sustained. And that's really difficult. And it's why we haven't had uh, significant reform thus far. But we're going to keep trying. Yeah, those are those are great points. Let me uh, let me offer as a follow up, since we are getting a little a little uh, short on time, uh, a couple of questions uh, together that we've gotten. Um, one is with respect to personnel, and, and feel free to chime in whoever uh, whoever would like on these. Um, the first is is personnel. You know, you you talk about personnel costs being very large, especially when you include um, both military and civilian costs. And so the question is, what are our ideas for changing the personnel compensation system, uh, especially in a context where it's politically impossible to close excess bases? Um, and the other question uh, relates back to the discussion we were having earlier about legacy systems. And, uh, you know, there's, there's this reason as to why legacy systems uh, still exist, and it's because they tend to be necessary until the newer systems are theoretically are, are operational. Uh, and this commenter gives the example of the A-10, which the Air Force wanted to cancel, but uh, has a unique capability, perhaps, that, uh, uh, had, that has not been replicated. So uh, feel free to, to, to jump off on, on one or both of those, if you like. In the negative, I would never call the A-10 a bad legacy system. <laughs> it's too bad that we have uh, an F-35 that's not going to be able to perform that new mission. But I think part of the legacy systems that we need to be re-examining are ones that we know are going to be vulnerable to current and emerging threats and thinking I always like the example of you know where we're throwing multi-million dollar bombs on like a, a pickup truck you know thinking about are there more cost effective and creative ways for us to be a, attacking these kinds of threats um, you know and with all of the personnel costs I would throw contractors in there in addition to the cost of civilians and military personnel um, I'm not an expert on the personnel system but I think it's looking at what benefits are best, you know, for actually achieving our goals. I think that you've had good ideas and there have been some reforms in that area to try and control costs. I think there needs to be re-examination of having military personnel perform duties that really should be performed by civilians or contractors instead and not having them be kind of the department of everything. So I think there are a number of areas for reform. We, uh, we have only a couple minutes left, so maybe I'll let everyone uh, try to end the bit on a positive note and just say, uh, you know, I guess uh, you know, my question is, is, you know, where are you all optimistic, uh, maybe in the, in the next year or, uh, or perhaps in the longer term? Um, and I'm, I'm curious to hear what you all might think about, you know, what, um, what Pentagon spending is going to look like in a supposedly, you know, capless world as the, the, the Budget Control Act caps are expiring. Um, and maybe what you think the next year and, uh, you know, might hold given, uh, given, you know, the COVID crisis. And I'll just, uh, I'll just, you know, say, you know, quickly on, on my part. I mean, I think that, um, I, uh, you know, the, the, as awful as, as COVID naturally is, I think that from a budgetary standpoint, as, as I said, you know, in, in my remarks at the very beginning, there is a rethinking of, of priorities. And that's very healthy to do. I mean, it's the kind of thing that, that should be happening really all the time. Um, and, you know, part of the issue, as I see it, is that we have a very disjointed accountability system where, um, you know, different people are sort of not talking to one another and, and working on different parts. Um, and so there's, there's never really or, or often not this sort of very holistic approach to, um, you know, what are we spending money on and what are we getting in return? And so, 
um, I am optimistic that that conversation is uh, beginning more so than it has in the past and it will continue. Um, and I think that that's something that frankly, regardless of what your opinion is on what the role of the Pentagon should be or, or where exactly they should be focused, um, I think that there, there's a lot of uh, cross-partisan and cross-ideological uh, agreement. So, um, but I'll let you three uh, close it out and, uh, and share, share where you're optimistic. All right, I'll, I'll go first. Uh, I would say in a, in a capitalist post-BCA world, um, we will find out uh, if OCO will actually go away. The, the reason for um, maintaining OCO disappears if there are no caps anymore. Uh, so will the gimmick disappear as well? That will be interesting to watch. Uh, I, I wouldn't lay a bet on it right now uh, on, on either side. Um, as far as whether or not the COVID-19 uh, emergency is going to change how we do things, I would point out that there has uh, been money for the Pentagon, not large amounts of money thus far in the COVID relief packages. I mean, not large in the terms of Pentagon spending, not large. Uh, but we, um, in the Senate Republican plan uh, that is unlikely to be voted on in its entirety, uh, there is a, in particular, there's about $11 billion for um, industrial base resiliency funds. That's a significant amount of money uh, and for any other department. Uh, and I think there needs to be more oversight, and I'm hopeful that there will be more oversight of exactly how that money would be spent. What am I hopeful about? Uh, I'm hopeful because this year, as we were going through the NDAA process, uh, there was a more of a spirit of bipartisanship and uh, Democrats and Republicans working together on amendments than we had certainly last year. Uh, so I am hopeful that that will continue and there will continue to be bipartisanship on, on good cost-cutting amendments. Um, I can go ahead next. I am hopeful about seeing veterans who are coming home from these wars and who are staying engaged in the process and challenging those wars and able to credibly talk about our spending priorities and whether it's truly keeping us safe or not. I'm hopeful to see so many you know, people on the streets and understanding that they have a role in their democracy. I think what we've talked about is that there is a real lack of accountability and that unfortunately I think we need to have citizens step up more and, and I'm really excited about how they enrich our democracy and our priorities. And I, I guess I'll, I'll wrap it at least on this question. I, I, um, I'm hopeful uh, to, to go back to, uh, to uh, refer to what you were uh, talking about, Wendy, and then to also go back to what we were talking about before, that that we did get some modest OCA reform measures included in the House version of this NDA, and we're going to have to fight to keep it in conference, and we're going to have to, you know, if OCA is still around next year, head, or heading into fiscal year 2022, 20, we're going to have to fight um, on some of the additional reform options that, that we've laid out, and reform options that uh, you know, all of you and other stakeholders lay out in the coming months, but uh, we, we, we got bipartisan amendments uh, uh, on this included in the House NDAA, and that's, um, you know, it's a small step, but um, as, as, uh, as we were discussing before, I, I think a lot of this is going to require incremental reform. The Pentagon budget is not going to go uh, from $750 billion to some more sustainable number overnight. Uh, and so it's on us and, and those of us across the ideological spectrum to uh, uh, not only chip away, but to to make uh, the Pentagon budget at whatever level it's at, uh, ultimately more accountable to uh, to taxpayers. Well, awesome. Uh, well, thank you all uh, so much. We are obviously past our time. I uh, did as good of a job as I could to wrap it up, but uh, really appreciated hearing your perspectives, uh, Andrew, Wendy, and, uh, and Mandy. And uh, thank you all to everyone who attended. Thank you for some really great questions. I think it, uh, hopefully we answered them all as well as we could. And, uh, uh, and hopefully we'll have some events like this in the future, maybe uh, diving down a little bit more into, uh, uh, into some more nuanced topics. Um, I think there's, um, we obviously kept this conversation at a very high level, but I think there's a lot of, a lot of room for more in-depth discussion. So um, thank you all so much and uh, have a great, uh, great rest of your weeks.